All right, so I will go ahead and introduce today's speaker. So we have Brooke Stewart who is joining us. So Dr. Brooke Stewart is the founder of Let Go and Grow International. She is a holistic provider in private practice where she assists her patients in unlocking their own intrinsic powers to heal. Over the past 12 plus years, Dr. Stewart has worked with thousands of people through her online platform, speaking engagements, and one-on-one -on -one through her private practice. She holds degrees in medical anthropology, psychology, and integrative medicine. Dr. Stewart uses a unique combination of holistic counseling and functional medicine to personalize and tailor treatments. And she's out of Orlando, Florida, but again, through telemedicine, she's able to connect with patients who are located anywhere at this point. As a physician, she's deeply committed to her patient's personal growth and development as she uses solution-oriented methods to clear issues create health, and assist people in realizing and actualizing their true potential. So welcome to Dr. Brooke Stewart. Hi, and our, guys. Yes, hello. Our other hello. presenter today is Doug Suffield, and he was born in Toronto, Canada. He's a dual citizen, and he attended Florida State University, graduating with a triple major. After several years in the remote Canadian oil fields as an emergency medical responder, Doug decided to pursue a career in acupuncture and oriental medicine, believing that Eastern medicine coupled with Western could greatly benefit patients living with chronic pain and other issues. Doug began his master's studies in Gainesville, Florida, and he desired a more challenging experience, so he moved out to Austin, Texas to complete the rest of his integrative medicine studies. And while out in Texas, he was chosen in his senior year to participate in a six-month internship at the Central Texas Veterans Affairs Hospital. Doug has since gone on to gain national board certification in acupuncture and oriental medicine and is fully licensed and accredited. He works at UF Health Jacksonville as a pain coach and education specialist as well. So welcome also to Doug as our second guest presenter today. And I will go ahead and hand off the presentation now to our speakers. And again, if you have any sort of questions or anything like that for us, please let us know through the chat box or through Q&A. Perfect, thank you so much, Natalie, for having us on here. And I am so excited to talk to you guys about acupuncture and in the context of Chinese medicine and specifically how it can assist with pain management. And just for an overview to have some context about what we'll be diving into today, we'll definitely begin to introduce acupuncture in the context of how it was formed, go over Chinese medicine just a bit, um, some of the research regarding how it works, conditions that it can treat. And then of course, we'll go into practicalities of how it can be applied to pain um, and then resources that you can take home and and if you are interested in finding a practitioner exactly how to do that um, so thank you again natalie for introducing me i could not have done that better myself and doug um, do you want to take a moment to just say hi really quick Sure. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, glad everyone was able to come and uh, be a part of this amazing uh, just initiative. Um, so yeah, very excited to get started. We do only have an hour, and so we've got you know uh, a form of medicine that's thousands, you know, ranging from thirty five hundred to eight thousand years old, depending on who you ask. So we're going to try and cram all of that into 45 minutes. So, uh, you know, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask, uh, type them into the chat box. We can also do a Q&A at the end as well. So if you uh, want to write them down, we will get to them at the end. Uh, just make it better for the, for the flow of the presentation as well. Absolutely. And here we're going to really try to kind of like illustrate acupuncture, what it can do for you. And I wish I could see your hands at this moment, but I'm interested in how many of you have really experienced acupuncture or forms of holistic medicine. Now more than ever before, actually, Doug and I were having a conversation before this presentation. Um, ooh, I apologize. Can you guys, um, did you guys, it's still working well, right? Yeah, we can see you. A couple of people are using the raise hand feature just to say that, yes, they've experienced oh, okay. acupuncture. So there is a raise hand Perfect. button if you're interested. Um, you're not screen sharing at this point. We can just see you, but that's oh. probably fine at this point until you kick it off. 
Okay, perfect. So um, I, it was just switching screens. It's a live call, you guys, so bear with us. But um, so perfect. So I just wanted to kind of see how many of you guys, you know, had experiences with complementary modalities. I think one of the things that's so exciting about this is that so much is possible, especially with integration. And now more than ever before, acupuncture has become a modality and a vehicle for change in that way to get people in touch with their body's own intrinsic power to heal. And so from a functional perspective, really the objective of acupuncture, which is really the penetration of the physical body, right? With actual needles. So creating that little micro trauma, and we're going to go into how it works, but from a functional perspective, really what we're working to do is restore homeostasis. And in my practice, when I'm working with a patient using acupuncture, I always explain a lot of times it's like jump starting a car. So it's, it may take different amounts of time for each person, depending on what we're working with. But the beauty of acupuncture is that not only can it potentially alleviate acute pain and provide relief in those moments in time, it can also help to work with the undercurrents and the deep landscape to kind of clean it up to make it easier in the future as we move forward. One of the reasons why I love acupuncture for pain specifically is because of its ability to provide that immediate relief that can help patients make those more underlying changes. For example, get the lifestyle changes of getting to sleep earlier, changing what they eat, changing their mindset. When we're physically feeling better, obviously mentally and emotionally, we're gonna be feeling better too and vice versa. So anything we can do to create that time and space, especially especially with that intentionality coupled with a practitioner that has your health goals in mind and facilitate that acupuncture can be a great way to not only work with pain and work with a number of different conditions as we'll see. Um, but it's also a, a great uh, way to set that intention and create that time and space for yourself. So the goal of an acupuncture position is truly to restore balance and it help you to attain internal homeostasis. When I mentioned that jump starting of a car, a lot of times it's like, okay, session one, session two, I know there's a little bit of relief, but it may die off a little bit more relief, then it comes, it goes back to that, that, that baseline that you came in with until the body gets so used to being in a non-pain state that it then can just sort of drive. And obviously everybody's different based on the underlying imbalances that you come in with, but this is kind of the idea of getting the body, shifting it into being used to being in a non pain state. And so the goal of an acupuncture position is not only to kind of look at all of the aspects of the human being, mind, body, heart, life, but to also work in the context of what are the patient's choices and then using acupuncture as a direct way to bridge those gaps and treat the system to make all of those changes easier down the line. Today, we're obviously going to be focusing on acupuncture specifically, but Chinese medicine in and of itself is a very whole and complete system. And we just wanted to mention this for context because it includes acupuncture, herbal medicine, tween all, which is basically a Chinese form of massage, cupping, which I don't know if you've ever seen all the professional athletes, right, with those big circles on their backs. But that's uh, what cupping is. It brings blood to the surface. It's, it's interesting. Uh, it's basically very much like a deep, deep, deep tissue massage. Um, moxibustion, which is is basically an herb, herbal like smokestack sort of thing. Um, you may have seen it. Definitely check it out later if you're interested. Um, but we also work with, with counseling in terms of patient education. So really being partners for our patients to teach them how they can take the acupuncture treatment and apply what we found, those, uh, how, how we can work with those underlying conditions by working on the imbalances through specific mindset, diet, and lifestyle changes moving forward. The acupuncture has been shown in history to have notings of it about 8,000 years ago. So this is a very, very old um, uh, medicine. And, but more recently around that 2,500 years ago, Mark, we start to see a lot more evidence of acupuncture in existence and in practice. And basically how practitioners would find these acupuncture points was, was truly through observation. They would see redness or inflammation in certain parts. For example, if there's pain in a certain area, right? We have all of the signs of inflammation, that swollen potential nature, 
or that redness. And obviously if it's more chronic, it's going to be a little bit more silent and invisible. But when certain points are felt, you can see how it is associated with the different uh, pathways of the body. And so through obviously thousands and thousands of years, they found these points that were associated with other aspects of the body, but also important for localized use as well. Um, so basically, uh, what's interesting as well is, you know, you may hear Chinese medical practitioners talking about yin and yang and different facets, which I think Doug is going to talk more about as we proceed, but we can always speak about it from a biomedical functional perspective, which is really what we're going to be focused on here today, because we're obviously living in a more Western world, depending on where you're joining this webinar, which is the cool part of this day and age. But, um, but truly, you know, understanding the bi biomedical component is extraordinarily important for even health and organizational as a whole so that we can understand what's going on. I think that any holistic modality, any modality that you engage in, it's very, very important to understand why it's working or why it is not working if you can. And dropping into that understanding can obviously, we know with placebo effect, um, you know, in terms of the literature, we know how effective that is. But really, in my opinion, that has far more to do with your intention. And the more you understand about what you're up to and why, the more, the, the more it, it works for you on your behalf. So that understanding piece, which is why you're all here, I think is a huge game changer in terms of that movement forward. Um, in terms of acupuncture and all the conditions it can treat, because of the way it's structured, working on your internal imbalances, when your system is balanced out, of course, you're going to reach um, better qualities and levels of health per se. But the World Health Organization has also done re a review and an analysis um, of acupuncture, and it's been shown in the treatment of mental health, um, different neurological disorders, respiratory, aller allergic reactions, cardiometabolic disorders, pain um, for detox, GI, and so, so much more. And this may not make sense if we're coming at it from a pill equals an ill mentality or address an ill with a pill. But when we're working on the landscape, that overarching and underlying ecosystem and actually cleaning it out, releasing what isn't effective, bridging those gaps and developing what is, it makes a lot of sense that we would just begin to create a platform and a foundation to just keep moving forward upon. So in that way, acupuncture can create quite a bit of resilience. Brooke, real, real quick, do you want to go ahead yeah. and share the slides? We are not um, seeing the slides. I think we're starting to get into oh, really? the presentation here. Um, oh, I, I have been moving along with the slides. I apologize. That's, that's strange. Okay. What are you guys seeing? We are just seeing your uh, picture, so your video. Oh, oh geez. I've been uh, using the slides. Let me see. Go back to this. Huh. Hang on. I apologize. I was literally on how acupuncture works, um, which is like slide number five. Um, okay. You jump in there. You know, it's great introductions to now. You know, <laughs> okay. Get to in depth. Let me see. Um, yeah. Thank you for saying that. Let me exit the full screen and make sure that I can get back on. I'll go through the slides with you guys one more time. Let me sh make sure I'm sharing my screen properly. Okay. We're going to do this. Can you guys see my screen now? Yes, that looks good. So we just got to put that into the full screen. There you go. Great. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to kind of, I'll just briefly overview um, what we said. So we talked about the acupuncture overview, right? Um, so this is a good little recap anyways. So from a functional perspective, you know, looking at how acupuncture works, restoring balance, attaining homeostasis, working on jump starting that car. Um, Chinese medicine is, is, is really the foundation of where acupuncture lies. Um, so it's obviously originated in China with um, roots up to 8,000 years ago, more recently, 2,500 years ago, and obviously present day practice throughout every country in the world. Um, the conditions that it treats are, are absolutely, you know, um, uh, there's a wide range of conditions going from mental health uh, disorders to hormonal, neurological, and then obviously musculoskeletal and pain, which we're focused on today. And in terms of how acupuncture works, this is where I think it gets very, very interesting. And you guys can see the slides right now. 
Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so I always, before diving into this slide, which is really kind of like how acupuncture promotes blood flow, relieves stress, uh, relaxes the musculoskeletal system, reduces pain, decreases in, uh, inflammation, and brings about that homeostasis, let's go into kind of like the holistic piece. As you can see in this picture, acupuncture points are basically all over the body. And I find that there are three major effects of acupuncture that are extraordinarily interesting. And if you think about creating, puncturing the skin, right? Creating a microtrauma, there are three effects that can take place when this happens. So one is a localized effect because anytime you are drawing attention to a certain area of the body, blood flow will go there. Now in the blood flow contains all of the neurochemicals and natural painkillers within in the anti-inflammatory um, parts um, of the uh, components that actually begin to heal that localized area through vasodilation and going um, and bringing the blood flow to that area specifically. So that's how acupuncture helps in a local sort of way. So if you have shoulder pain and you put a needle here, that's probably going to help to some degree just by penetrating the skin. Second effect, which I find very, very interesting is systemic, right? So every time, no matter where you put a needle in the body, you will get that rush, that cascade of neurochemicals and natural painkillers that flood the entire body. So if you put a needle here and you have knee pain, so if you put a needle, I'm not sure if you can see my screen, um, me visually, but if you put a needle, like for example, in your shoulder area and you have knee pain, it could also still help just because all of those that flood is in the bloodstream. The third effect of acupuncture that I find most interesting is something called the somatovisceral effect, which is basically body to organ system. So meaning every time you stick a needle into the body, let's say, and we're going to be talking about a little device called the AccuLeaf later, but basically it's a point in between your thumb and your pointer finger. And a lot, this is well known for helping with migraines and different um, head, neck pain disorders. Um, but what's interesting about this, you would think, oh, wow, how could this ever help with my had a neck, but because of how acupuncture works and the channels and what we call them are meridians in Chinese medicine, because of how it works with the nervous system and how that communication takes place, a point on the body can actually assist another, um, another part or another function in the body to, um, it can actually begin to heal it by way of the nervous system and how it communicates. So those are the three ways acupuncture actually works through a localized effect, systemic, which is whole body all through the bloodstream. And the third is that somato visceral response and that reflex helping, you know, a point on the foot can help with, with, to, to detox the liver or regenerate, um, liver cells. So that's, I find, uh, very, very, very interesting. In terms of how it works, like we've mentioned, you know, it increases blood flow, it relieves stress, relaxes the muscles, reduces pain um, through the endogenous opioid system, um, basically decreases inflammation, and it uh, helps to restore homeostasis. So in terms of the difference between acupuncture and acupressure, because some people may wonder, okay, what's the difference between that pressure and the puncture? In terms of acupressure, it is still extraordinarily effective for many reasons. One being your intention to work on that aspect of your body and connect to it um, versus um, divide yourself from it. So that connection absolutely promotes healing time and time again. Um, and that is obviously something that you can do at home on your own. Um, but acupuncture is more of that micro trauma. So it's a bit more of a deep um, healing experience when it comes to um, therapeutic benefits. So, and through the, from that systemic effect, you, it's still helpful to topically place pressure on points for relief, but acupuncture in general is just a deeper form of healing. If you're looking to kind of get out of pain or to engage, um, those accelerated sort of results. And in terms of accreditation, I know acupuncture is a bit new, um, to kind of the zeitgeist in a way or the collective. Um, but it's, it's very much regulated. It's, it's very much, if you go to NCC AOM, you'll find um, the national certification for acupuncture. And then each state has its own structure and requirements as well. Florida is actually in this base, probably the strictest state, uh, along with California, you have to take four board exams, which, um, which include a biomedical 
uh, examination. And, and usually uh, graduate school is between three to five years. And then if you go on for your doctor, it, it can be up to two additional years um, from that place, depending on how quickly you go through the program and residency starts at year one, you're in the clinic, you're observing, um, and then you work your way up to a practitioner uh, sort of level. Um, and then obviously you can qualify for your board exams and start your own practice from, from there. So um, that's a bit on the accreditation and a bit on the context of acupuncture and how it can be helpful. And Doug, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Great, thank you, Brooke. That was uh, an amazing start and very uh, eloquent. So I really appreciate um, your framework and your, your state of mind and your opinion on all these facts and matters as well. So we do have a question. Um, real quick, uh, if someone is terrified of needles, even though they are thin, are they painful? So uh, there are different gauges of acupuncture needles, but as a whole, they're about as thin as a human hair. So there is a sensation of it being uh, when it's punctured into the skin. Uh, but I like to reference that, you know, if you've ever had an eyebrow plucked or anything like that, could be because, um, you know, my wife does pluck my eyebrows. I'm Scottish and Irish. So, uh, you know, I inherited them from my, my father, my crazy scientist eyebrows. So she usually makes me pay for my bad choices when she plucks my eyebrows. So maybe it hurts me more than most people. But if you've ever had an eyebrow plucked, it hurts less than that. So there is a sensation. Uh, however, it is not painful. And usually if you're in pain, the other reference is if you're coming in with back pain, knee pain, headaches, the acupuncture needles are going to hurt less than the pain that you're already in. So I hope that answered your question. So, um, you know, as Dr. Stewart said, balance. Balance is the key of traditional Chinese medicine and, you know, medicine in general. Uh, physical balance, emotional balance, and spiritual balance. Um, you know, thinking about, you know, your balance of your diet, thinking about, you know, you've worked a very stressful week uh, at work, you know, you've put in 45, 50, 60 hours. I mean, you're exhausted. You need to sleep. You need to rest. Uh, emotional balance. You go through something very emotional. Uh, you need to spend time really coming back to that baseline, coming back to that homeostasis. And that's something that is in, deeply ingrained in the medicine. Uh, it's known that when this balance is disrupted, pain and disease arise. Uh, when this balance is regained, which is the focus of acupuncture in Chinese medicine, to regain your inherent balance, pain and disease will not exist. So what's really cool about this is now um, focusing on pain management. You know, we've got a lot of things going on in this country with the opioid epidemic, um, how we've been treating pain in the past. We realized that it was not feasible to move forward with that anymore. So now you talk to providers that are, you know, the experts of their, of their field in pain management, they are all talking about the biopsychosocial aspect of pain management. And this is directly from uh, Practical Pain Management, which is a peer reviewed medical journal. And it says that pain is viewed as a dynamic interaction among and within the biological, psychological and social factors unique to each individual. So it's great to see that what we've been talking about mind, body and spirit balance, we are now seeing, you know, spoken in a different language, but I think the, the essential meaning is still there, that balance is very important for whole health and a great quality of life. Next slide, please. Great, thank you. So balance and pain. So how does this work? So, you know, we do have to go into a brief introduction to the fundamental concepts of Chinese medicine. Can you go back for me real quick, Brooke? Thank you. Um, so we do have to talk about some of the things uh, that acupuncturists will talk about with you. It's how we understand symptoms and syndromes and, and imbalances in the body. So I'm gonna try and demystify these for everybody. So um, primarily pain and emotional unrest, you know, that biopsychosocial, there is an emotional uh, component to pain. Even if it's just, you know, you roll your ankle, how long is, am I gonna be out? Am I gonna be able to go to work? Uh, I've got a birthday this weekend. Am I going to be able to interact with the kids? Anything. There's always an emotional component to pain. Um, so what we realize as acupuncturists and, pro and providers of Chinese medicine is it's primarily a qi and blood stagnation. So blood is understood as the same that we understand it now. You know, it's circulating in your, in your veins, in your vessels. It nourishes, it builds. You know, we talk about anemia being, you know, a blood deficiency, but basically 
Um, you have to build it through your food and exercise and things of that nature. Qi, this is a little more ethereal of a concept, uh, but it can be understood as cellular respiration, uh, metabolism, or even the electromagnetic energies produced by the body. So it's really, you know, if you, for example, if you have been pushing yourself, burning the candles at both ends, and you know, you, you're lethargic, you can't really focus, you've probably consumed some of your blood and chi. So a nice, good rest, uh, a day off, relaxing, you feel better. Uh, so that's kind of the idea of, of those. Yin is understood to relate to the structure. Uh, so bones would be very yin in nature. Uh, it's also cold and dark and the calming aspects of life. Yang would be a little more, it'd be hot, it'd be bright, it'd be the vigorous aspects of life and the function. So again, everything is balanced. Uh, think of it almost if you want to like a magnet, there's a North pole and a South pole, a positive and a negative, but it is still one magnet. And if you cut that magnet in half, you wouldn't get, you know, a magnet that's only positive and negative. You would now get two magnets with a negative and a positive. So uh, it's just kind of that interrelation with, with everything. Another great way to think about uh, yin and yang, and this might be for people who have a little more of a medical background, is yin being that parasympathetic, that rest and digest, that yang being that sympathetic, that uh, fight or flight response. Both very important for life. Both are always trying to come back to the, to the basic, come back to that homeostasis. So there's another way to kind of understand that concept. So really when we talk about stagnation, it's great to picture a network of rivers, streams, and creeks. So, you know, here in Florida, you think about the Everglades or anywhere else, you know, where you've got water. When it flows unobstructed, you know, it circulates, it pools in areas, it runs in others, uh, it flows smoothly, and life flourishes everywhere. Uh, when the waterways become blocked by debris, uh, you know, garbage, dead leaves, branches, the smooth flow of the water is disrupted causing areas to back up, stagnate and fester. Life becomes uh, harder to, to find a foothold. And you know that debris, that garbage and dead leaves and branches, that is what we understand to be the poor diet, the sedentary lifestyle, uh, mental and emotional traumas. All of those block your natural waterways. So here's a great image of the meridians and the acupoints, you know, very complicated, but you can see the idea of rivers and estuaries uh, streams flowing in and connecting the entire body. So acupuncture in traditional Chinese medicine uh, and the treatment of pain is primarily restoring physical and emotional balance. We've already talked about how there's always an emotional component to pain. Uh, promoting the free flow of blood and chi and calming the mind. Uh, you know, even with that emotional balance, you know, there's a lot of patients in my private practice and even here in the hospital that report, they go for imaging, the imaging comes back, oh, well, we don't see anything, so we're not sure what it is. They go for lab works and they go over and over again and they keep getting uh, the same answer, which is we're not sure why you're in pain. So there's a great uh, example of that emotional imbalance where I'm in pain and yet no one understands why. So uh, the primary ways that we improve that balance would be the acupuncture that we've talked about. Uh, body work, uh, we also touched on Dr. Stewart with uh, the cupping, the gua sha, which is scraping, uh, tai Chi, Qigong, you know, things like that, which is exercise and uh, stretching, calisthenics in Chinese medicine, food and herbal therapy, and again, the acupressure and the acupuncture. So another thing with Chinese medicine is called microsystems. So wanted to kind of demystify this again, because depending on where you go to get acupuncture, you've probably had, uh, you know, your provider feel your pulse or has asked you to stick out your, your tongue, uh, something we don't usually do in this culture. Uh, however, everything can be looked at in terms of these microsystems. So if you've ever had a kid at home with a sore throat and a cough or strep, have them stick out their tongue. It's gonna be white, it's gonna be hairy, and there's gonna be red prickles all over it. That same tongue, once that patient or that or child feels better, you look at that tongue again, it looks completely different. So it is a way for us to see what is going on. It's Chinese medicine diagnostics. They're non-invasive, which is great. Um, they're pretty much free. You don't get charged for them other than the actual acupuncture session, but there's no additional you know, lab fees and imaging fees. And they do give us a great way to start as well as a full intake where we ask you questions about how you're feeling, what makes it feel better or worse. But as you can see here on the tongue, the back is gonna be the bladder and the intestines. 
Each side can be registered with the liver or gallbladder. The middle is going to be your digestion, your stomach and your spleen, lungs at the front. And then the very, very tip is going to be the heart. So I would uh, recommend everyone, you know, take a look at your tongue and just see what it looks like. It's always a little fascinating. Next for a microsystem, which is very important, is the ear. So here is an idea and here's an example. There's many of these different uh, diagrams out there. This one's for musculoskeletal points, so specifically for pain. There's also one that has to do with internal organs, uh, with emotions, with all of these other things as well. So uh, the reason we love auricular acupuncture is number one, you can treat the entire body with the ear. So it is possible, let's say if someone has uh, lumbago or back pain, we can put a point in their ear that's specifically for that. And then we can have them move around the room. So we know that that acupuncture needle is not going to impact their ability to move. We don't have to worry about it getting pushed deeper or bent or anything like that. So it's great for uh, quick treatments and it's great for treatments where patients want to actually do a little bit of rehab and movement with it. Uh, it involves neurological reflexes, like we've talked about, the release of neurotransmitters. I mean, the, the vagus nerve, the vagal nerve runs right underneath the ear here. So we've shown it has a huge impact on cardiac output, on stress, on pain, on blood pressure and heart rate. Uh, NADA is specifically an auricular acupuncture technique, which I'll touch on in a second. It's concerned with detoxification, detoxification from uh, overconsumption of alcohol for uh, addiction to uh, tobacco, even for mental and emotional detoxification, which would, our be, uh, which would be our idea of trauma that has been unexpressed or, or has been repressed. Uh, battlefield acupuncture, something that's very quick and effective, specifically focused on pain and stress management, used a lot with acupuncturists without borders, where they have to treat a number of people. Uh, they don't have the time to lay everybody down. No, not everyone gets their own room, but we can go down a line and treat 60 people uh, and have them get some relief immediately. So it's, it's really uh, beneficial. So here are the NADA points. So the NADA points are the same five on everybody. Uh, it's community-based for the most part, uh, which means that it is less expensive than traditional or full acupuncture sessions, specifically because everyone gets the same five and you get to sit for about 35 to 45 minutes in a chair. Uh, usually it's one of those zero gravity or recliners. It's great for cravings, great for addictions, uh, even great for mental and emotional imbalances. So we used to do this at my uh, program in Austin and every week we would have this and we would all treat each other and we would just get to hang out for 30 minutes. And the stress relief is amazing. It feels great. You feel like a totally different person. It's almost like taking a 40 minute or a 50 minute power nap. Uh, so it is really uh, beneficial. So this is another microsystem. Uh, specifically for the musculoskeletal pain. And so what we love, what I love about this specifically with acupressure is that we can all actually go in here and feel along this metacarpal here, which is the main bone right on that web margin. But you really wanna get in there, start underneath uh, the, the knuckle right by your, uh, your pointer finger here, the big knuckle, not sure if you can all see me. And that would be your head and your neck. And you slowly can move all the way down and come all the way down to the, the lower part of the body. And so this is something where uh, if you've got a head or neck pain, uh, migraine, you can touch this point and then you can actually move your neck around. So again, there's no needles in there. There's nothing to stop you from being able to move it. However, with the fascial lines and the neurological implications, this will actually help loosen that neck and you moving it. We're working on two different angles here. Oh, we got some questions rolling in here. So let's see here. I'll go ahead and take a second. Yeah, if you want to start with, um, let, let me go back into the chat, Doug, and I can read some. I know we said we wouldn't interrupt, but there's so many. So we are going to approach a couple of these and then we'll save a couple for the end. But someone was asking about asthma and coughing. Is there any sort of evidence for use of acupuncture with those types of conditions? Absolutely. There are... Um, many different treatments. One of them, uh, funny enough, is moxibustion, which is the burning of what we, is mugwort or artemisia. And it's interesting that you would think with asthma, you wouldn't want to burn something, no smoke in the air. However, it's done on primarily on the back and it has been shown to actually increase um, lungs capacity. Uh, cupping on the back as well can detoxify the lungs. Uh, use that a lot for acute upper respiratory infections. Uh, points on the front of the lungs as well. So there is a lot that we do without even getting into the herbal imp implications of it. So um, 
acupuncturist absolutely treat asthma. And, and I don't know, Brooke, did you want to add anything to that as well? I think you covered it. I mean, in my practice, I primarily used, used acupuncture to treat it. And there's a really cool point, kind of, um, th there's several points that can be helpful. But I think with asthma, it's, what's interesting is you can uh, use uh, acute points, but also kind of, it, a lot of times people have trouble anchoring the breath. And so there are other systems that we can use to kind of capture that breath and build up that resourcefulness. So, uh, but Doug, you nailed it. That's, that's a great overview. Thank you for that. And then um, I'll throw one more in there and then we'll hold some of the other ones. But someone was asking too about, um, you know, not only comorbidity, so addressing multiple conditions, is that possible? And then kind of a more specific in there is fibromyalgia, if, if you have any experience or evidence that you're aware of for use of acupuncture with fibromyalgia sure. or comorbidities in general. Absolutely. So, um, the way that Chinese medicine works is we don't necessarily label a disease. So um, what we look at is the inherent imbalances, the syndromes, why things are happening the way they are. So if you picture a tree, um, a leaf way, way out on one of your branches, that could be your symptom. That could be your headache, your back pain, your shoulder pain, your anxiety. What we do is instead of just saying, okay, we're just going to treat that here. We follow that down. We figure out what is causing that. Is it uh, for a headache? Let's say, is it stress related? Is it anemia? Is it, um, you know, light sensitivity? What is going on that's causing that? So the same thing with the fibromyalgia is we would, yes, look at that definitely and have that in the back of our, our mind when we're, we're coming up with a treatment plan, but we would look at what's causing it. Why is this happening to you specifically? And where is it manifesting in your specific case? And depending on that, body work would be one that we'd work with, acupuncture points. Uh, we'd probably want to look at dietary suggestions as well, a moderate exercise plan. We don't want to push people further than they're willing to go. Uh, we are all about supporting balance and supporting healthy changes that will enable you and empower you to get the results that you want. Thank you for pausing to go ahead and take those questions. We'll hold off. So if you have anything, those are from the chat. If you all are putting them in the Q&A tool, we're going to answer those a little bit more toward the end. But again, just keep throwing those questions in there. If you have something that's come up, Doug is answering some of these as he's been speaking as well. So just make sure, again, you're following along. We're going to go into the acupressure point of the presentation now as well with Doug. So I'll let him take back over with the speaking part. Perfect. Thank you, Natalie. And real quick, actually, um, with the fibromyalgia. So something that has recently come up to my attention, specifically working uh, with the PAMI team and some of our pharmacists, is that one of the things we're realizing uh, is that specifically with fibromyalgia and some other pain disorders is, uh, and I don't know if this has happened to anybody, but the longer or the more uh, pain medicines that we are giving or that the patient is taking doesn't necessarily mean that the pain or there is no tangible connection with if I take more, my pain goes down more. Uh, in some cases, actually taking more pain medicine can actually increase the pain. And I was talking to one of the pharmacists here and they said it had to do with the exogenous and endogenous opioids. So Basically, we create our own opioids in our brain. You know, we stub our toe, we do something, we step on a Lego. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever done that, but it is probably one of the worst pains out there. But our blood, our brain floods that area with opioids, um, as well as dopamine, serotonin, healing factors, and everything like that. The more we take, the less our body makes. And so getting, you know, the auricular acupuncture, doing some moderate exercises, that all releases more of those endogenous or inside opioids. You know, we talk about a quote unquote runner's high. Now, running with fibromyalgia, obviously, uh, is not something that we would say, hey, go out and run. But moving after about 15 minutes does release the same dopamine, serotonin, and those neurotransmitters, as well as endogenous opioids. So those are some uh, things that we're seeing that acupuncture does as well. Even just inserting the needles into the skin, they have shown a release of dopamine, serotonin, and healing factors, regardless of where they are. So now when we get a good acupuncturist or provider who can really tailor this treatment specifically to you and figure out what is causing the imbalance, which is manifesting as your fibromyalgia, uh, I mean, we're uh, we've seen a lot of great results. So I don't have any specific studies with me right here. 
Uh, but if you look it up in Google, there is a lot. There's a lot being done for fibromyalgia. <clears throat> okay, so hopefully that answered the question. So going into the heavy hitters here. Um, so again, working with that main metacarpal, the top being, we call it dub eye, but it's for neck pain. And all the way down, lingu is for your lumbar pain. Again, this is something that you can do. You can really push in here, find a sore spot. It should feel nice and tender, almost like a little bit of a bruise. And go ahead and move your neck. You know, roll your shoulders back. Or if it's your lumbar, press it and try and bend over. Do a little side bend and see if you can even feel in your chair, your lower back start to release a little bit. Um, and the LI4 we've talked about, great for headaches, great for anything, facial trauma, facial pain, trigeminal neuralgia. Um, it's also really good for Bell's palsy, one of the main ones there as well. And next, okay, so scapular pain. If everyone's ever had that pain that sits right between your shoulder blades, it can be hard to sit at a computer screen and it's constantly burning and annoying. So uh, there's a point right here. It's on the back side of your hand. If you make a loose fist, it's where that skin kind of pooches out there or pushes out. You're gonna go ahead and grab that and really push in there until you get into the bone and it should feel nice and tender, especially if you have any shoulder pain. So when you do that, do it on the side that has the shoulder pain and then really try and roll that scapula back and roll it forward. And that's something that is able to give relief that, you know, the reason we love acupressure, and I think one of the, the major reasons for this presentation is to raise patients' empowerment and their efficacy, letting them know that there's things that they can do. You know, any relief is better than no relief. So if you can Give yourself, if you're at an eight and we can take you down to a six or you can take yourself down to a six and for a little bit of time, I mean, that's any relief is gonna allow you to breathe a little bit easier and give you some respite from that, that nagging chronic pain. Uh, and next, the big one is gonna be that PC6. So, you know, C-bands, those are really big. They came out in the eighties, all through the nineties for motion sickness. They actually sit right over this acupuncture point or acupressure point. Uh, they look like a little sweatband with a little plastic nub on the inside of them. So this is something to use, you know, for morning sickness. Um, we use this a lot with uh, cancer patients that are experiencing nausea. Uh, and it's great just for any type of stomach or nausea and vomiting as well. And again, uh, so here's our little AccuLeaf that I think if you complete one of the surveys, you will get one of these. It sits on LI4, uh, the C band we've talked about for PC6. And now I will let uh, Brooke explain these other three. Awesome. So the last two are these really great apps that you can find just on your phone um, that you can actually use protocols. You can actually apply protocols um, based on kind of what's coming up for you. And EFT is a really cool little practice I often use with my patients. And it's literally the tapping of acupuncture points just to kind of bring attention to that area and receive the same benefits as you would with acupressure. A lot of times this is used, it's called emotional freedom technique. So a lot of times it's used to kind of like work through certain um, anxious states, depressive states, or even certain emotions like feeling unworthy. I think as Doug mentioned, the biopsychosocial part is so interesting how the mind and body is so connected and how each of the organ systems in Chinese medicine are reflective. For example, the heart has a lot to do with shock. Um, the liver has a lot to do with anger, frustration, depression, the spleen sort of stomach digestive area has a lot to do with over worry, overthinking, kind of that anxiety sort of feeling, which we all know if we've felt really anxious and we're ahead of ourselves, right? A lot of times we feel it in our gut. And so we can see how that connection takes place. And EFT is a great practice for that. A simple, simple way to begin to use it. There are definitely EFT practices you can look up on Google that are far more comprehensive, but something that I like to do with my patients is just have them tap these three points because right here you're touching on lung, which is that inhale exhalation, which has a lot to do with releasing sadness and grief, the pericardium, which is the protector of the heart, and also the heart, which in Chinese medicine is the master of emotion. And so, um, so that's a simple thing to kind of do to just kind of calm the system and shift into a more of that mobilized, expansive parasympathetic state where it's easier to tap in to that power to, to heal. 
and in term, let's get to the next slide. Oh, there we go, perfect. And in finding a practitioner, I think you know it's great to go to the NCCAOM website. Also, something I didn't mention on this slide, but I think could be helpful is that whole mention of the NADA protocol. A lot of times there's an organization that, um, that has a community acupuncture available, and I'm not sure how that's changed in the context of this year, of course, but there are community acupuncture centers across the United States, which may be worth looking into. And you can find those on a website called POCA, and I'll make sure to send that to Natalie so you guys have access to it. And uh, in general, I think it's always great to kind of ask your doctor, ask um, you know somebody that you trust. A lot of times, someone knows a great acupuncturist in the area. So having that, you know, asking for a referral and looking for great experiences is a, a great way to find someone. Also, just you know, under like being able to connect with the practitioner, um, making sure they're in alignment with you and your belief systems and your values is huge. Checking for specialization, whether you're looking to work with more of the mental health aspect or the pain management aspect. Obviously most acupuncturists can work with both, but um, since it is, since we can work with so much, sometimes you may feel more comfortable going to someone who has a bit more of a specialization. And so that is a bit of what I would kind of look for when finding an acupuncturist. And, um, and Doug, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think you you touched on it all. I think definitely word of mouth. Um, you know, when you have a, a practitioner and a, a provider, acupuncturist who's able to elicit uh, some change in, in the community, I mean, people love to talk about it. So I've always found that word of mouth, uh, people refer their friends, you know, they're not going to send you to have a bad experience. So, uh, but again, look for yourself. You know, some people want and value different things in a provider. Uh, but I would definitely say yes, asking your, your uh, primary care, asking your friends, asking your community uh, if they have any recommendations is a great start. Absolutely. And never being afraid to ask questions because that's part of our job is to answer them and to educate you on learning the language of your own body because you already know it. Sometimes it's just covering up the debris because you have so much awareness available. It's just putting it to good use and changing that awareness into um, a kind of a utility and bringing it into an experience of health. Um, so thank you guys so much um, for this. And we are going into the q &A. Perfect. Thank you. So we have a number of questions that were already asked. So we're definitely going to go over and trying to answer these. So if you do have to go at 1 p.m., that's fine. We're going to try to get through these. Probably just take us about 15 minutes to get through the questions that were recently submitted in the Q&A or the chat. If you have anything and we go way too long, um, we can try to follow up with some people generally or provide some additional resources and links in the follow-up email that we send out to everyone. So don't fret if we don't um, call upon your question. So I will start with um, one of our earlier on questions. So in looking at mental health specifically for acupuncture, so it, what is its use with depression and anxiety? We're having some questions about that. Is, is there some efficacy there? Absolutely. Um, and, and basically, uh, a lot of times we're seeing now as you know, there's a, an inflammatory route to mental health. And so when we're looking at decreasing inflammation, not only the therapeutic process of speaking to a practitioner, which you can obviously get from a counselor or from your primary care, um, but just in terms of, of working with this system specifically clearing that root cause, whether it's, um, you know, depression, where we're looking at liver health, making sure that we're detoxifying properly, at the core of it, we're also looking at stress. And so if there is a mismatch with food, with lifestyle, or if there's kind of um, stagnation in the system itself, that will build stress and come out in your vulnerable spaces, whether that be in the mind or in the body. And so working to reduce that level of tension and inflammation will automatically assist in accessing better states of, of mental health, but also we can work specifically on it Certainly, a lot of the root cause of depression could have to do with more thyroid, more blood sugar, inflammation, or several, several root causes. So if we can kind of pinpoint some of those underlying aspects, um, that can be really, really helpful. And then, of course, we can work with neurotransmitters and whatnot, too, just in that kind of cascade that comes about with acupuncture. 
And an, an additional question that was asked, um, does your chi relate to your nervous system? And if so, how? Sure, I can feel that one. So um, I know we briefly, we touched on, you know, chi and blood and it has, they're not opposites, but they're, you know, like the yin and yang, like the tails and heads of a coin, they're together, they cannot be separated and yet they, they do different things. So with the, the chi and the nervous system, I mean, if you, another way to think about chi is electricity. It moves quickly. It um, follows paths of least resistance. Uh, so, I mean, that is pretty much just like your, your, your neurons firing is chi. Um, however, we can even go in deeper and look at, uh, you know, an organ's chi versus an organ's blood and then look at the whole body chi or yin and yang. So for a nervous system, we talked about how the sympathetic nervous system, that fight or flight would be a yang chi uh, reaction. The yin, which would be that rest and digest and repair, that parasympathetic, that would be a yin chi. So chi is, is very complicated and it's something that even providers and, and um, practitioners of this medicine, we still talk and not argue, debate maybe, uh, about what its actual meanings are and how best to relate it to uh, Western medicine. But um, Qi would be primarily the nervous system, the, the neural transmitters and the electromagnetic uh, magnetics that are being uh, sent. Thank you, Doug. And kind of going along with that, I'll skip to a more recent question that was submitted there. You can probably see it as well. So um, someone was just looking for further explanation and understanding about, you know, you, you're talking about these specific points within the body or, you know, the meridians as they're referred to in acupuncture. How does one little point specifically pinpoint an organ system or a muscle group or something like that? Um, can you explain that a little bit more and try to clarify that for people? So there's, oh, I'll, I'll briefly go and I'll let Doug take over. But um, basically there's something called a somatovisceral response. And that's where it's that body to organ system. So for example, that LI4 point can work on the head and neck and obviously a variety of different points um, through the nervous system and the way it communicates. Um, but that's like typical kind of reflex. Certain points will kind of reflex into other areas of the body. So this is also like allowing us to zoom out and see the body as a whole, not just the sum of its parts, if that makes sense. That's beautiful. There's also a great book and it's called Spark in the Machine. And it talks about how embryologically and embryological development has a lot to do with uh, fascial planes with channels with things like that so when we grow from a single cell uh, and we grow we have these organizational centers which is why a shoulder becomes a shoulder an elbow becomes an elbow and you know all of these things are very complex and yet we are organized uh, intrinsically from internal forces uh, so that is how you know we can actually affect a lot of changes it's just simply the way that we we grow and we evolve embryologically there's a lot of research being done there uh, not to mention stem cells are also a big part of what we do, uh, triggering them and their healing factors, uh, not to mention. But really with the tongue, I see that, you know, that is more of a diagnostic. So we don't usually treat the tongue. Uh, there are points underneath the tongue for, you know, uh, aphasia and things like that. But in terms of the tongue in that diagram, it was more for diagnostic. Uh, so hopefully that makes, that makes some sense as well. Perfect. Thank you. And in looking into some specific conditions, we have a couple of questions. So in looking at auricular specifically, uh, have you seen anything with MS in auricular or maybe just MS being treated with acupuncture or any other type of integrative medicine in general? So yes, I would say, so in my practice, the first two sessions are called a case review. So this is where we're always looking for the root to kind of establish a new baseline from that space. So for example, if somebody is struggling with energy and they're not sleeping, there's not an amount of coffee that's going to be able to really, really resolve that. So with that said, when it comes to MS, to any specific, um, to, to any more specific disease, as, since we look at the patterns and constellations from this approach, we're really looking for the underlying deficiencies and the mismatches and signals, seeing how far that can go while also addressing what's coming up specifically. But yes, I have seen the acupuncture 
specifically, but also some of these more underlying aspects work on conditions like MS, absolutely. Thank you, and kind of um, a, a little different still um, neurological as well. So we're looking at trigeminal neuralgia, so a type of facial pain syndrome. And have you heard of anything or had any experience with treating that through acupuncture or integrative options? I treated a lot of Bell's palsy. Um, so I have not treated tri trigeminal neuralgia, but something that is along the same um, issue being the nerve uh, and the facial root nerves. Uh, really what we're focusing on is the harnessing the immune system and also uh, smoothing out that flow of the energy of that chi, that electric, that burning sensation. We focus on redirecting it, on calming the inflammation, of soothing the inflammation, as well as getting back to a better baseline. Uh, so there has been a lot of uh, acupuncture being done for, for that because it is so difficult to treat right now anyway. Uh, also, essential oils have been really good. Uh, essential oils applied topically, specifically for detoxification. And there is a lot uh, that I have done in my private practice, combining multiple different modalities in terms of dietary, uh, acupuncture, acupressure, uh, aromatherapy, essential oils, all of these things to try and come at it from as many different angles as possible, but really just focusing on the body's ability to heal and regenerate because you cut your hand, you lose a fingernail, anything like that. You don't have to think about it. If there's no barring any other comorbidities, your body will naturally heal and regrow something like that. So the same can be said in terms of other areas of the body, which is where Chinese medicine focuses on the innate healing factor and the ability of the patient to heal the patient. And um, I'll chime in really quickly um, with TMJ specifically. So MS is obviously a little bit different because it's uh, the whole body and how it's communicating with the nerves and, and obviously immune system um, plays a huge role. So we wanna take out anything that's competing against the rebuild of the immune system. And same when it comes to TMJ, we wanna take out anything that's creating stress because we know when we're stressed, we're clenching, we're tighter, we're more, um, there's just more tension there. However, it's also very much more localized. So we can place needles in this area to kind of free it up, to bring the blood flow there to where uh, healing properties can kind of come in and work for us on our behalf. So that would be, a, that's actually a really good example and kind of contrast the difference between like an MS and a TMJ that's a little bit more specific that we can get a little bit more um, acute, acute relief while still lowering the tension. Thank you. And we know we've reached 1 p.m. So if you have to drop off again, the recording will be available. We're going to keep going through and answering these questions that have been submitted. So that way, when you receive the recording later, you can jump over to the Q&A section. Uh, this recording again will be emailed out to everyone. So we'll try to get through these questions as best as we can here with our speakers. But if you have to leave at this time, we understand and we appreciate you joining us. The post survey will be emailed up to, out to everyone as well via email. And getting into the next question, so looking at NADA, um, so we talked a little bit about its use with smoking, I believe, because we were talking about addictions and you did bring up tobacco. So do you have any sort of information on the results for the success rates with the use of that for smoking, tobacco use, addiction? In terms of the actual success percentage in front of me, no, I do not have that. Uh, it's a great question and I will definitely make sure to, to have it for next time. However, I can speak to my own private practice and my experience with multiple different patients that came in specifically for smoking cessation was their biggest worry and their biggest concern. What I liked to do is again, I always seek to empower my patients. I always seek to allow them to take control of as much as they can in their life and their own road to, to health and wellness. So with NADA, yes, it does work on the, um, the uh, endogenous opioids. It works on the neurotransmitters, which help with uh, cravings in general. You know, if we are full of dopamine and serotonin, we have those are those really feel good chemicals. Uh, it does help with the cravings and it does soothe the cravings. Second would be, sorry about that. Second would be a, a air level of mindfulness where I found this was probably one of the most helpful things on top of the acupuncture would, I would ask my patients, um, when do you smoke? 
Is it when you're driving? Is it when you're at home? Is it after a meal? Is it just constantly, you know, when is it? And depending on their an answer, it would always kind of be the same. If it was driving or at night or anything like that, just like kind of snacking, for example, I have them stop what they're doing and only smoke the cigarette. No phone, no computer, no TV, no driving. Pull over on the side of the road and enjoy it every single second of that cigarette. And once you are very mindful and you have no other distractions, you actually realize that your body doesn't necessarily like the way that the smoke feels. It's more of a habit. It's more of something that's done uh, in correlation to other things. So when you take away all those other distractions, uh, plus the nada, plus some of the herbal remedies, there's a lot of good herbal remedies for um, smoking cessation as well, specifically focused on stress management. Um, it's been very powerful. Thank you. And moving into questions. So I believe we kind of touched on um, back pain being addressed by acupuncture. Someone was mentioning a few of the vertebrae, specifically L4, L5, S2, but would you say that acupuncture could be an option for someone to consider, you know, on a you know, case by case basis for back pain? I would, you know, I think one of the most incredible things about acupuncture is the results that can be attained for pain. I would say that with any kind of pain, especially back pain, I would, I think that if you can, and if you find someone that you like, I would absolutely give it a whirl because there's so much that can be done in the treatment of, of pain. I mean, I've had patients who have literally worked for 10 years, had a ton of injections on all kinds of medications and acupuncture, that kind of jump starting of the system was truly the only way they were able to get out of pain, but then also have just enough space to make those underlying changes. Like for example, maybe build a habit with a foam roller or begin to walk again, or like, you know, just on a regular basis or make those dietary changes that are driving up the inflammation, exacerbating change, help them to lose weight, take pressure off the body, all of these different things. So I, if there's, um, if you, if you are drawn to it and you are in pain, I think it's, it's a great modality to give a try to. Yeah. And definitely with this whole initiative too, we're trying to promote that people understand these various topics and then have them just as one of the items in your toolbox. So, you know, you wouldn't think that any one thing would fix anything. And this goes for any condition or pain in general. So it's just one additional option for you to try if it's something that you have access to. So I, I, I do think you answered that. Absolutely. Right. And, um, and I'll just mention this too. Sure. It is great alongside conventional treatment. So if you are going through certain, um, like a shot protocol or on medication, being on acupuncture and working with an acupuncturist and getting acupuncture can typically only enhance the treatment that you're going through conventionally speaking. So it's not a competition. It's more very much complimentary. So I think that that can provide some reassurance as well. Um, and, uh, and liberty to try some of these new alternatives, especially acupuncture. Absolutely. And even just, like I said, uh, you know, not, or like Brooke said, sorry, not trying to, to combat or not trying to challenge, you know, it's great for pre and post surgery. If surgery is something that uh, a patient of mine has decided is what they want, then I am not going to try and dissuade them from what they think is the best option for them. I'm going to support them regardless of, um, of what it is, because, you know, if you believe that that's going to help, then that's already going to help. Uh, even just the fact that you believe it, me telling you, don't do that, don't do that, it's not going to help. So acupuncture before surgery helps prime the body, prime the immune system, loosens the muscles, gets the blood flow better. And then acupuncture after surgery does the same thing. So it can be utilized regardless of if you decide to do just acupuncture, if you want to do PT and acupuncture, if you want to have surgery, if that's something that you and your PCP def uh, decide that that's the best course of action, then acupuncture can be utilized there as well. Perfect. Thank you both. Uh, we have a couple of questions kind of about availability and cost. So in looking at um, one, is acupuncture covered by insurance? And I would say that that's a complicated 
question to answer. I don't know if either of you have specifics from your practices, but it would be, you know, the answer would be some, some of it is, and some of it is not. And it's about finding a provider who accepts it. So not all of them will, even though some forms of acupuncture for certain conditions are covered, it might not be the case that the provider that you want to see is able to accept that. So it's, it's getting those questions answered by the practitioners. I don't think we have a, you know, an exact good answer. It's just looking at if you have insurance or any type of governmental insurance coverage too, you have to check with them first, see who the providers might be and then see what the options are or looking into some of these, find an acupuncturist who's licensed near you type of sites that are out there through the boards for acupuncture. You can then contact those people. They have options. So someone asked specifically about community acupuncture. So if one of you could at least explain kind of what that is and what that means, because it is a reduced cost method for accessing acupuncture. Oh, absolutely. I'll just uh, go really quickly on that. Um, so with absolutely, so community acupuncture would be in a setting of community. So you may have five other people in there at once. You may honestly, it may only just be you and the practitioner. It really depends on how busy the clinic is. But I would say if you are interested in acupuncture, don't let cost be a barrier to entry because you can always find somebody who's, you know, who kind of is in that copay sort of range, typically, depending on who you're going to. Also, schools are highly regulated um, and guided by practitioners that have been in practice for decades. And I will say that in my practice and in several that I'm aware of, we can provide super bills to where it's basically a coded receipt that you can uh, submit to your insurance um, for to apply to the deductible or to get completely reimbursed. And HSA and FSA accounts are also typically accepted by clinics. So, um, so there's always a way typically. Um, so, so it's just finding, and I actually think just kind of like on a, um, uh, more psycho spiritual level, I suppose that you'll find who like that. Don't let that be a barrier to entry because I think you'll find, um, what is a right fit for you, regardless of those, um, kind of like seeming limitations. Thank you. And I know someone asked too about, um, it earlier on that I answered via chat, but is it available with UF health at all to employees at any clinics or anything like that? And so it's not available to employees. So at least on the Jacksonville campus, employee health and wellness, it would be more on the wellness side. They don't have any hands-on things going on right now. So that includes the massage that we are used to if you're an employee here. So being able to pay to access that, it could be in the future though. Um, and then if you're on the Gainesville campus, there is UF Health Integrative Medicine. So they are an integrative clinic and they are very busy. However, it is an option that you can look into if you're over in the Gainesville area or if you work at UF Health Shands over in Gainesville. And then just in general, again, we're gonna provide everybody with a lot of resources. Some already are on our website for how to find acupuncturists who are near you. So don't feel like if one hospital system doesn't have it, there are definitely plenty more people that exist out there. Um, so it, it just might not be an option through your insurance or something like that. You're gonna have to get creative with making a couple of phone calls to find those people who can provide it to you for you know kind of a cost or a cost plan maybe that you're able to afford and use to try it out. Absolutely, there are, um, real quick, I agree that um, schools are a great place to start. Uh, you know, they're very, usually very affordable and you're not just getting a student who doesn't know what they're doing and there's no oversight. You have a clinical director, you've got multiple different people in the room, like you will get a great treatment and it will be at a reduced cost. There's also certain acupuncture clinics that do sliding scales. Uh, and that is a case by case basis and depending on the provider as well. So I couldn't agree more that don't let cost, you know, stop you from, from trying this medicine. Uh, just like finding someone that you uh, have a connection with that you can talk to and feel comfortable with that financial implication is also part of that relationship. So there are a lot of uh, like modern acupuncture is a community style acupuncture clinic. And I think the first treatment's free. Um, and there are some other, uh, depending on where you are and where you live, there are definitely some resources in your area as well that I would highly recommend you look at. Perfect, thank you. And then um, a couple of questions about acupressure more specifically. So if you were to use acupressure 
how long would someone sit down and do that for? And then how long could you expect results for? Would somebody have to say, sit there for 10 minutes holding a spot? And would it last a certain amount of time? Or would they need to add this to their routine to do daily or every morning and evening? What's kind of a routine that you would use if you were gonna try acupressure for self-management? I think, sorry, I'll let, um, I'll go first. And um, basically uh, with that said, so everybody's a bit different. And I love the, how acupuncture in these points can communicate uh, information to you, right? It's your symptoms communicating to you and potentially resolved by you, right? Completely. And, um, and so when you're pl placing, uh, you know, applying acupressure, I think you really want to do it until the pain honestly begins to neutralize or go away. And so that would be your metric is, is there a shift? You know, what does that look like? And kind of continuing, um, and I would say three minutes is kind of probably like a good, I mean, I mean honestly, uh, uh, 30 seconds could be a big, you know, could make a big impact just depending, but really you want to kind of monitor for your body's response and continue to apply the acupressure until it begins to, to neutralize. Thank you. And, and again, for sleeping, is there any sort of points either just for calming down to prepare people for sleep or just with some assistance if people have sleep difficulties? Absolutely. So there's actually uh, an additional point located on the back uh, along the occipital ridge of the skull. And it's called onmion, which is funny because we it sounds a lot like Ambien, and it's specifically for uh, sleep disorders or to promote sleep. Really, what I like to do, uh, it's a little bit of a harder point to find, but even just come along if you're able to, come along behind your ears until you feel the ridge about your your skull. And you can do like uh, we were talking about the tapping. You can come around the front here of your head, but really come along with your thumbs along the back part of your skull, and you will find some areas that are tight and they are tender. A little bit of acupressure, it doesn't have to be constant. You can do a circular motion front and back and just kind of explore back there and see where the pain goes. What does it feel like? Uh, I found that to be very, very relaxing uh, without even having to know exactly where the acupressure uh, point is, but that still is something that we can utilize that's very relaxing. We also wanna talk about you know, sleep hygiene. What are we exposing ourselves to before sleep? Uh, are we looking at our screens on our cell phones? There's a lot of research saying that the blue light from cell phones and screens shuts off our natural melatonin production. So melatonin is something that we all have. It's a neurotransmitter that is released in the brain when the sun goes down. As soon as the sun goes down, the production goes up to get us ready for sleep. Now, if we disrupt it with fluorescent lights, with working night shifts, it throws it all out of whack. So really sleep hygiene, you know, ambient lighting. I know this sounds... Uh, a little hippy dippy of me, but the Edison bulbs, the candles, like that's what I have in my house every night after about nine o'clock. There's no fluorescent lights on, no over light lights on. And uh, it's something that just is soothing. It gets us back into a better circadian rhythm on top of everything else that you can do with this acu uh, pressure as well. And a sleepy time tea. Can't overestimate <laughs> sleepy time tea. Love some sleepy time or chamomile. It's great. Um, we have two more questions if you guys can still hang with us here so that way we can have them for the recording. So we're looking at, um, unless I'm misunderstanding this question, um, Doug, I think you can see it there, but I think they're just asking about migraines. So with, with the use of the ear acupuncture with auricular acupuncture, is there usefulness with migraines for that type of acupuncture? Sure. So real quick, just, uh, yes, I have seen some reduction with the piercings. Again, um, you know, one size does not always fit all. And another way to think about it is any stimulation that's constant is no longer a stimulus. It's kind of why another reason, you know, with the neuroplasticity and the way that our body works is if our body is doing something like sitting at a desk, you know, you're sitting with your arms in this, the reason your neck gets tight and sore is that your muscles and your, your structure are basically saying, okay, this is our new normal. Um, we put some acupuncture in there. We create some micro trauma with some cupping. We have now created a new stimulus that the brain says, oh, okay, now we got to flood a bunch of stuff in here. We got to get some new blood cells there, uh, new circulation, you know, all that stuff. So it's how we can actually elicit change structurally that your body doesn't do naturally because that's now just the way it is. It's baseline. Same thing I've seen with these ear piercings is you, you put it in, you get them pierced. They feel great for a little bit. And then sooner or later, just like if we had a really high pitched noise on in your room or a smell, 
you know, after a little while, you don't hear it, you don't smell it anymore. The same thing can happen with that constant stimulation. So yes, but also uh, there's some great ear seeds. They're little magnets that can go on there. Uh, those are really beneficial because you can take them off, let your body adjust, put them back on again when the pain gets specifically bad. Uh, but that's just my own experience with those. Yes, they do work. Maybe try one ear and don't do both. Um, so you always have another ear to work on if it does stop being as effective. Thank you. And then our final question that I can see in here. So can acupuncture, this might be a little more specific than we can answer, but we'll try. Uh, can acupuncture reverse the effects of a radio frequency ablation? And that could be one we have to find some resources for if we're not aware of that. I mean, I can field this one. So um, the radio frequency ablation, usually what happens is your, your nerves end up growing. You know, they are cauterized, but then just like we talked about is you cut your hand, you rip off a fingernail, um, anything like that, your body does start to heal. Naturally, your body wants to heal itself. It's always repairing and regrowing. Um, so acupuncture, I don't know about reversing the effects of radio frequency ablation, but it'll definitely help trigger your immune system and get new blood flow there and, you know, help it heal faster. But your body naturally after radio frequency ablation, the nerves do grow back, which is why we have to do it multiple times. Okay. Thank you. That was very helpful. And we had one more pop up. Um, can you talk about remedies, i.e. herbal liquescence? I just want to say that liquescent should be the vocab word of the day. <laughs> I'm going to Google that. Um, Brooke, do you use a lot of herbs and herbal remedies in your? I practice? do. I, I don't know. Is what was the? It was herbal liquescent. Is that? It's so I use a lot of herbs and um, I use a lot of like flower remedies and I I have a very specific protocol I bring my patients through which is core supplementation, therapeutic, food based, and symptomatic. So. I'm not sure what was there. What was the question again exactly on the herbal? Um, they're just kind of interested in herbals in general. So it looks like this okay. is just kind of a liquid form of taking herbals when okay. you're looking it up. So just any sort awesome. of herbal experience. So usually how I create the treatment plans in my practice, I have a core supplement protocol where we are making sure that they're getting the right nutrients in terms of a good multivitamin, a great probiotic. So they don't have to get it from food based for therapy. Uh, therapeutic purposes. We bring in a good digestive enzyme to utilize all the good food that they're eating, bring in something to detox and then something to calm the nervous system to bring it into a deep sleep. If any of those are issues, if those boxes are checked, wonderful. Um, but typically there's some room for improvement there. So I, I usually do that through more of like the nutraceutical realm, more of the vitamins. In terms of herbs specifically, Chinese medicine is brilliant. I don't think it gets better uh, in terms of how they think about herbs. I find that it's extraordinary when we can work on these patterns and these underlying roots specifically to drive function and to build substance like that yin and yang sort of sort of approach. And so here we can work on specific systems like thyroid, um, like hormonal imbalances, like just decreasing inflammation or building blood flow, even in certain areas of the body. And so I find herbal medicine kind of fits in that therapeutic category. And then of course it can work on symptomatic as well. There's certain things that really help to drive blood flow to, to help to bring the body through states of shock. Um, and then in terms of food base, that's more of like your basic and actually Chinese herbs have to have, uh, include things like cinnamon and turmeric, um, and ginger. And so that may be where, where that would lie, but I think really having an idea of how to work with and address all four of these categories can be a really great way to, um, build out your kind of herbal medicine cabinet. I agree. And it doesn't have to be as complex, right? I mean, we're, we're getting into, into it here with these, with these herbals and these herbal questions. So I love it. But what I like to do, I mean, we, uh, I live in Florida. I'm not sure everybody else lives, but it works, you know, if you're in a really hot environment, hot and damp, hot and dry, depending, but you know, um, we utilize food therapy almost, you know, uh, on a daily basis. We understand that you know, if somebody's really, really hot and they're inflamed, drinking Dr. Pepper and bourbon, probably not the best thing for you. I mean, probably not the best thing anyway, but if, if you're already hot and inflamed, we would like to see, you know, utilizing, let's say water with mint, cucumber and lemon in it, um, something like that, or celery, uh, juiced celery, things like that. I mean, 
really the medicine started first with food and then slowly evolved into be more herbal specific. But to get a, a to really sink your teeth into why the herbs work, I mean, they're antioxidants. They scavenge free radicals. They search the body uh, for detoxification and they do that. And they do it even better than your own body or they help your body do it better. So, you know, versus what we do in allopathic medicine, where we give you exactly what you're, you know, your vitamin D deficient, we are going to give you a large dose of vitamin D. Uh, with TCM and acupuncture in Chinese medicine, we would say, okay, well, what can we give you to utilize vitamin D better? What can we give you to help you, um, you know, number one with some dietary and yes, get some more vitamin D in you, but we want to make it more bioavailable than just giving you the one thing because, you know, whether you're drinking milk or whether you're, you know, eating an orange, it's not just vitamin C in there. It's vitamin C, it's riboflavin, it's all these other things as well. Uh, and the and with milk, you know, there's, there's calcium, but there's also vitamin, you know, D and all these other things um, that you need. So we look at it as, again, a holistic medicine. So um, that's, you know, what I was always explained to my patients, diet first and then herbs as well. Thank you, Doug. I appreciate you answering that. We have one more that popped up, but we'll reach out to you individually on that question. We do have to vacate the conference room we're using right now. So we appreciate everyone joining. Again, if you hung out with us, um, we're going to send out the recording and a follow-up email with a lot of information based on the amount of questions that were asked today. So please do check that out and refer to it, and we will catch that last, last question via email too. No problem there. But thank you to both of our presenters and everyone who attended and stuck around, we can tell there's a lot of interest in this and um, there are some follow-up directions we can go on with these webinars. So we hope to see you next month. We'll be doing anti-inflammatory diet, but thank you all and have a great afternoon. Thank you very much. Bye guys, thank you. Be safe.